Hi, and welcome to Maths Appeal. I'm Bobby Seagull. And I'm Susan Okereke. And this is the first of a brand new podcast series, where our mission is to make maths accessible to everyone. We're both maths teachers, as well as massive fans of the subject, and it's our aim to prove that maths is everywhere. It's relevant, it's rewarding, and it's also really good fun. Every week, Susan and I chat about a particular aspect of maths, sharing our main observations and experiences as both students and teachers, and showing its importance in real life outside of the classroom. Then Bobby will set us a puzzle based on the topic, and while we're working it out, we'll hear from a guest who might be a fellow maths fan or maths champion. To get maths appeal off to the best start, our guest on this podcast is the one and only... Johnny Wall. He's 80 years old. Nine squared minus one squared. And he's a total maths legend. We went to his house to chat about his career and to find out what he thinks about maths education today. After that, back to the puzzle, we'll go through the answer and our methods of figuring it out. The discussion topic for today is place value. But before we get stuck in, maybe we should introduce ourselves properly. Over to you, Bobby. I grew up in East Ham, got a scholarship to Eton, became a banker for a bit, studied maths education at Emmanuel College in Cambridge, and went on to a TV show called University Challenge. I made friends with one of my opponents, Eric Monkman. His team beat mine, but I've forgiven him. And we recently presented a show on BBC called Monkman and Seagull's Genius Guide to Britain. Sounds very busy. <laughs> yeah. Um, I've also written a quiz book with Eric, and I write topical quizzes for BBC Radio 4's Today programme. If you haven't guessed, Bobby loves puzzles. I love puzzles. Um, I'm also a part-time maths teacher, a doctorate student at Cambridge University, and I just released a book called The Life-Changing Magic of Numbers, How Maths Can Make Life Better. I feel exhausted thinking about that. <laughs> I do forget what day it is sometimes. Uh, but what about you, Susan? Well, I grew up in a similar part of East London, Manor Park, and I studied maths at Edinburgh University before training to be a teacher. I've taught maths for over 12 years, from primary school children through to pensioners, and I recently did a master's in teaching where I was encouraged to explore what effective teaching and learning really is, especially in the maths classroom. I'm an NCETM, that's National Council for Excellence in the Teaching of Mathematics, mouthful, um, accredited professional development lead where I have delivered a number of courses and workshops for math teachers from primary school teachers all the way through to further education teachers and I really believe that learning goes beyond the classroom and I've had the pleasure of collaborating with places like the British Museum and the Museum of London to design contextual math resources based on their exhibitions with a view to bringing math to life. Also I'm a massive fan of maths jewellery. I can tell I'm a fan of your calculator earrings. If you want to find out more about our math stories, please subscribe to this podcast and follow us on Twitter and Instagram. We're at Maths Appeal. We'd love your support and feedback, so do get in touch and give us a nice rating. And that way we can spread the maths word far and wide. Right then, Maths Appeal Podcast 1, Topic 1. Let's talk about place value. So firstly, we should make sure that we're on the same page. What is place value? So I guess it's the, it's the value of each digit in a number. So we've got, let's say, 365. The five is the unit, so that's just five. <laughs> Whereas the six in that is actually not six, actually it's 60. But it's in the tens. And the three is three hundreds. So each number has a different value depending on where it is in that chain. So how we're going to do this is um, going to set three questions that we'll do the same every week. Uh, the three questions are, what first comes to mind when you think about this topic? Question two is, how do you teach this topic to students? And question three is, what are the common issues that arise when teaching this topic? And we're going to share them as two math teachers who obviously teach in different ways. Do you want to start, Bobby? The first question is, what first comes to mind when you think about place value? So for me, the place I start at is like if you've got a unit, a one, mm -hmm. and you think of oh, what's, what's sort of the next level up. And if you multiply that by 10, we get the tens. So unit to 10. And then if you're going to multiply that by 10, you go from tens to hundreds and then so on. So units, tens, hundreds, thousands. And then sort of on the flip side, the smaller version. So you've got units. If you divide that by 10, you get tenths. You divide that by 10, you get hundreds. And you divide that by 10, you get thousands. So in my head, that's what I'm thinking about. 
All right. Okay. Well, it's funny. So I think when I think about it as a teacher, it's one of the most important subjects, but I also believe it's one of the ones that's the most misunderstood. Um, it's kind of at the key of so many things like converting in money, converting measure. But again, as I say, a lot of people don't really seem to have a very good grasp of it. And it's kind of the grasp is important because it's knowing the difference between 2000 and 20,000 and 200,000, which actually is quite massive. And a big thing that I've kind of noticed with students is that whole like kind of lack of understanding as you said you know you've got your units your ones uh, and how if you're going to go effectively to the left as, as it kind of gets bigger they have an understanding of that but when it, we go the other way to the right where we go into decimals and fractions that's where a lot of things can be kind of lost yeah and again with students it's trying to visualize mm. how it is because again a lot of especially primary classrooms they've got you know the number line with the yeah. naught to let's say 10 plus 10 on the left hand side and the right hand side will have minus 1 to minus 10 and I like the idea of like a number line for uh, place values and you've got units if you're going if you're sort of reading from right to left units then tens then hundreds then thousands and the right hand side will be units tenths hundreds thousands it's almost like a, a mirror line of symmetry there but then so how do you introduce it because I think for me the visual is so important. It's kind of using things like, you know, deans, you know, those dean blocks where you've got a small one and then you've got a, a row, a rod, which is effectively that represents 10. And then you've got a square 10 by 10, which represents 100. And f getting the students to understand that they're related, we're effectively multiplying by 10 each time we go along a place value or dividing by 10 if you're going the other way. So the visual element is something that I think is super important. And then connecting it to the whole idea of naming numbers. Again, I don't know how you found, but when I've worked with, with sort of students, it's this whole idea that when you ask them, they can label units, tens, hundreds and then thousands. But beyond thousands, they get pretty confused and they go straight to millions and don't understand that effectively these place values are in groups of three, which is the place value, then tens and units. So after thousands, you have tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, and then you have millions. And then what comes after millions? Ten millions, mm. hundred millions. After hundred millions, billions. billions. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> there yeah, we go. Yeah, and then after billions... 10 billions, 100 billions, yeah. after billions. Trillion, isn't it? Trillion, yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. So it's a whole idea that there's like an infinite number of place values and actually we work in such a small part of it that when you start playing with that, on the flip side, after units, after, sorry, or ones, which is kind of more commonly used now, you've got tenths, then hundredths, and that's kind of one over 10, one mm. over 100, one over 1,000. What do you think comes next? One over 10,000. What comes after that? One over... 100,000. What comes next? One over a million. And that's the whole point. The fact it effectively goes on infinitely. And that that's something that I think actually getting the kids to understand that can really open the door to what the number system, what place value really represents. What, what I try and do is sort of similar to that, but I try and bring in a context because um, I use, I'm a big fan of astronomy and space. Okay. Like I'll try to talk about like, uh, you know, if I'm standing next to you, I might be one metre away. Um, if I'm standing away from the door, it might be 10 metres away. And I talk, talk about big distances like you know, where you know the, the circumference of the Earth might be like 40,000 kilometres. Oh, wow. And talk about the distance from the Earth to the sun is 150 million kilometres. <laughs> so sort of talking about the size and scale because place value is really good at helping kids understand that two numbers, they might look similar. But actually, they're, they're very different. Yeah. But you, I think the visual of knowing that, you know, there's a one for units and then actually for tens, that's ten ones. And actually for 100, that's 100 ones. For 1,000, that's 1,000 ones. And I think the visual of seeing what that looks like, maybe as it encounters or just massive dots, can really help the kids to understand what's actually going on. Because as you say, 312 is quite different to 312,000. And those zeros that have been put into the placeholders, can, if they don't understand that, then they they don't really understand the difference in size of those numbers. And then it's really good for things like rounding if they understand the concept of that. Yeah, so uh, sometimes I find this a tough topic to teach because as a maths teacher, you think, ah, oh, let, let's get stuck into the subject. But if kids don't have this basic mm. understanding, and as a secondary school teacher, you think, oh, primary school's done it, but obviously they've done so many things there. So you've got to make sure that you've re-taught them or sort of given that re-confidence in that subject. I think as well, uh, one of the things teaching year seven so that's kind of you know the beginning part of 
secondary school, so that's age 11. In a secondary school, I was do, I've done some work on transition from primary to secondary school. And in one maths class in a secondary school that say 30 kids, there's a potential of 30 different primary schools, which has taught this subject place value a very key one in potentially 30 different ways. And it's very difficult for a secondary school teacher to potentially cover or iron out all the misconceptions that might occur um, for those 11-year-olds. Yeah, and that's what leads to the issues as a, as a secondary school teacher because you've got to make sure that even if kids have been taught really well, if you're teaching in a particular way in a school, you've got to bring them to that level of uh, sort of understanding that topic. It's understanding the prior knowledge stuff as well. And I think that's kind of one of the big issues. So if we sort of, once we've thought about how to do it and sort of checking what the students know, which is tough, you know, working out as well what their misconceptions are and how to to iron that out. And that's kind of question number three. What are the common issues that arise when teaching this topic? Mm. So for me, it's like for me a massive thing is the students understanding and remembering what the place values are so they will know as I said before they will know units tens hundreds thousands but they don't know beyond thousands and they don't know after decimal point of like a tenth and a hundredth and then the problem with that is that lack of understanding makes everything else so much harder to kind of introduce yeah again for me a question I'll ask my students is how many tenths in a whole and if they're not, if they're not got that, they've mm. not really understood it. Because some of them, will, they've been sort of finding the lesson. When it comes to that sort of plenary question, tenths in a whole, they're like, oh, could it be a hundred? Could it be a thousand? And it, and it should be there. Ten. <laughs> ten tenths in a whole. It's the, it's it the cues, the clues in the name effectively. Yeah. But then also, I think it's trying to work out where possible the visual element of it and the scaling up and down, the ten times bigger, hundred times bigger, or ten times smaller, or hundred times smaller, and working out ways of doing that. Be also really great to hear if there are people, other teachers who have used resources that kind of do this really well. Because that's something that I'm hoping this podcast will kind of help with. Is where do you get good visual resources for this? I've used a few, but um, obviously always good to see more. Yeah, always good to see more. Right on to the puzzle, Bobby. What have you got for us? Okay, so let's say you take part in a card game in your local village fate. Imagine a sunny fate. You have two identical packs of cards, pack A and pack B. Each set has eight cards. Seven of them are numbered 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 and 7. And the final one is a decimal point. And your aim is to use each pack, pack A and pack B, to make a string of numbers. So you have to use all the cards. And your objective in this game is to make the largest difference between the two sets of cards. So we are going to come back to the solutions of this. Um, While you are all thinking about that, let's hear from a total maths legend. Each week, we're going to be chatting to maths champions, well-known names uh, who are big fans of the subject, or just people who are using maths in their jobs every day. And our first Maths Appeal podcast, our guest is a legend, Johnny Ball. Me, Susan and producer Jenny went round to Johnny Ball's house a little while ago and he's really generous to take time to tell us about his maths journey. Depending on your vintage, you might have grown up watching him on TV on Think of a Number, Know How or Johnny Ball Reveals All or you might have read his maths books like Math Magicians or Wonders Beyond Numbers. Here he is to tell us more. I'm Johnny Ball and I've been involved in maths on the fringe of education I think for about 40 years now. Um, which is very strange because I only got two old levels at school, but one was maths and I did get 100%, which shook the whole staff and said, how the heck did, how we missed this fella? Um, but they had, so I had to recover. So, but I'm still into maths. I love maths with a, with a great passion. I really do. And I always want to do things to help people who enjoy maths more. So how, how would you um, describe what you do with regards to maths? Because you're a legend if um, in the field. Well, I don't teach it. That's the main thing, you, you know, you, you've, got to, you've got to talk about it without teaching it and, and let it rub off on people. And you've got to fight, you've got to stop using the jargon and stop demanding they have to have a vocabulary to, to even talk about maths. You don't need that vocabulary. It, it's, it, it, you, you've got to keep it simple, otherwise you'll lose some people. And the other thing is, I was a stand-up comedian for, for 12 years, and... Uh, You've got to be very concise in what you say. You've got to be very explicit in what you say. They've got to understand it. And once they understand the picture you've painted, you turn it on its head, and that's comedy. 
and really, it, with teaching, it's the same thing. You paint a picture. As soon as they grab the picture, you either do something funny or something memorable, but then you leave it. Then you leave it. Don't pile on too much, you know. And that's the way I've behaved for, for a while, in a very ad hoc sort of way. <laughs> and so what's your journey been? So you said you left school, you didn't have... Yeah, I, I, I got three more O-levels on my own immediately, you know. So it could have been I didn't do any work. It couldn't, could have been I was playing snooker for money about four nights a week. It well, could have been I was playing chess. It could have been I was playing drums. It could have been all those things. It could have been all those things. Because as soon as I got a job with uh, what is now BA Systems, I just flew there and I got on the business course. But then I thought to be a, an industrial accountant for the rest of my life, um, no, no thank you. Um, no thank you. Um, and... And in those days, it was national service. But I talked to the people who come out of national service, the ones who really enjoyed it, and they marked my card. And I signed on, you get twice as much money, and when you're 18, 19, it's beer money. It's all beer money <laughs> anyway. But you get twice as much from day one. And you also choose where you want to go. So I choose specially to get overseas postings. You see? Radar. I went into radar. They could radars over the world. And sure enough, I came top of my class and they sent me to Wales. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but, but I was surrounded by buffins because it was a research centre for guided missiles, ground to air, air to air, radar, and I was surrounded by buffins and that, it just all rubbed off on me. I might ask about your earliest, your first memory of maths. Do you have a, do you have a, do you have a first memory? I have, it's in my book because uh, it is actually absolutely true. Well, my first memory of maths was my kid, my parents teaching me dominoes but double nines my dad always says double seven six dominoes double six dominoes have wimps double nines are brilliant because you've got the ten digits with the blanks the zero you see so bigger. and there's a game called fives and threes you have to make the ends add up to numbers divisible by five and three so double eight is useless and double seven is useless because double eight sixteen double seven is fourteen but put them at each end and you've got thirty oh. which is Ten threes and six fives, maximum score sixteen, and you play on a pegboard and you fly around the board if you're good at it. You see. And I was doing that before I got old. Them uh, five, six, seven. So that the mental maths you kind of were pretty right. good at. At school, as you say, you didn't do very well general subjects, but maths you did incredibly well. And how did you find maths in school? Like what? What did you I, like I, about I it? I loved it in primary school. It was during the war. You see. Um, I was born in 38, you see, so I was seven by the time it finished, but we were also, we were banging on our desk, we want homework. Oh, wow. So that teacher just had something right, you see, and he said, you won't get homework till you're nine. We want homework. <laughs> Could you have been one of my students? Yeah, oh, exactly. Students. That's right. Said so, no child ever. <laughs> right. So he used to give us these horrible Xerox sheets it's a very oily sort of system they had you know what's horrible and they, they smell and you know and he said here's a hundred sums if you do 10 i'm happy but in those days without television you could all listen to the radio mm. there was nothing unseemly for kids so you could all listen to the radio my dad would be reading the papers as a radio. my mother would be knitting a rug or something <laughs> and i would be doing the whole hundred Every time. Every time. You know, and it was just beautiful, and I just loved it. So I want to ask about your, so you, you were at school from, when did you start school, 43, 1943? Uh, yeah. So yeah. during the war, what was it like learning maths then? Was it like maths based on like no. soldier-based no. questions? No, no, like just, war? Just I just don't imagine like context-based right. learning. Right, one thing, they did not have frogs on leaves numbered and you're jumping from frog. They did not do this. Oh. They oh. had numbers. They had numbers. Okay. Numbers, one, two, three, four, five, seven, eight, nine. They had a number line on the wall. You, I think we stenciled the numbers. I think we did. But you had them on a wall. And they were in front of you. And the number line is perfect because you've got a number line of ten numbers, right? Mm. Addition, four plus three. Find the four, count three more. Five, six, seven. Mm. Subtraction, eight minus four, eight. Seven, six, five, four, it, and and that's what the numbers inside. Why do people not hide? Why do teachers hide the numbers? Why isn't aren't they surrounded with numbers mm. all the time? 
And why do they have to put frogs on lily pads? That's frog number three. That's frog number two. What <laughs> that all got to do is it's awful. I think you I know. did a lesson about a month ago with frogs and lily pads. You wouldn't have liked it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. so is, is that the problem? Yeah, yeah. 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 it's, yeah, it's, it's the numbers, the numbers are beautiful in themselves. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, so how did you go from stand-up comedy then to uh, writing well, some of the most successful I, I, maths? I did programs. in '67. I got the Valdinikin show, and I got I compared the ITV Christmas Night Spectacular an hour and a half. Oh wow! But I wasn't punchy enough. I wasn't punchy enough. I didn't break. I didn't make a wave. Wow. You know, I didn't make a wave. In fact, it, I was pretty awful. But I just They're started. They're quite big gigs, though, aren't they? They were very big gigs. Yeah. So I'd done very well, and in the clubs I was really doing very well, yeah. tremendously well. That's why they had to give me chances. It was natural, you know, because I was very strong in the clubs. But I love the club audience. I loved, I love, I love people, you see, and I love the audience. Mm. And I found with television, I talked to a camera I didn't like at all, because I wasn't talking to a person, and it took a long time to get to get used to talking to. So the I was camera. talking straight down the barrel of yeah, the camera. Yeah, uh, yeah, and I. I so I found it difficult. So I did play school. I was off a play school, and I thought it was a crackerjack, which had been a comedy show. Mm. So I said, "Oh, I'll go for this." So I, I knew after five, three minutes of this interview, I got this. He said, "Oh, you're going to be marvelous in play school." <laughs> I said, "What's play school?" He said, "It's on, on BBC Two at eleven o'clock in the morning for under fives." And I'm, so I'm off out the door. <laughs> and he said, "No, no, no, no." He said, "Come out." He said, "Try it." He said, hey, "You haven't got the job. You'll have to do one audition." He said, "But the money's quite good." And you'd be lovely. So I did it, <laughs> and um, I was. Uh, lots of actors went for it, and they're in a in a green room going, Humpty and I, <coughs> Humpty and I, and I'm going to, re- <laughs> Humpty and I are going to sing a song. Right, and, uh, and I thought, nothing. This. What am I doing here? You see. So, uh, so I went in. They said, "Will you do this the tree on a branch and the green grass grew all around and around?" The song. Sure. And I said, well, this is a song is about a, a tree on a branch and a, and a or a branch on a tree and a twig on the branch and a nest on the twig and and the green. But I would have told you that in the song anyway. So let's get on with it. And they were laughing in the in the <laughs> studio. They were laughing. <laughs> See? So I've got it. And the thing about it was, play school was a the sincerity of the people who made it was tremendous. Oh. And there's nothing like it now. And the sincerity of even Blue Peter in those days mm. was tremendous with Biddy Baxter doing it. And there's nothing like it now. And when you saw how sincere they were about, suddenly you lost this old feeling, I'm working for under fires, what will people think? You know, and it was just a very good program. You know, so I stayed for 16 years because you could do everything else. I could do the gallery as well, you see. You do it every fourth or fifth week. So it was all great. But I learned television. So I went into a seminar. I was walking through the television centre one day and somebody said, I said, where are you going? The six directors all passing. He said, oh, we're going to a seminar on special effects. I said, oh, come. It's for staff only. I said, who's going to know? And I went in. (laughs) In the next two years, I'd used every special effect, every single one in my program. For play school? Uh, No, for for Think of a Number. Of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I wrote, I did every special effect. Everything. Brilliant. So with um, Think of a Number, you, you wrote it as wrote well as that, yeah. presented it. So yeah. you wrote it all on your own? Yeah, I wrote everything, yes, I, I did. Wow. I, I, I lent a bit on Tomorrow's World at the beginning, because I saw how they did things, and I wanted to get um, contrast in the show. So I always did an intro and then, did, then spoofed it. You know, today we're going to talk about flight, and then I'd make sure they couldn't fly, you know. It always have to be a spoof. And then a serious bit of no more than two minutes, three minutes, where I said, where are we going from this? Well, you realise, as I said, when I did it in the 80s, it's because, it, well, it's 04, 05, the Wright brothers, right? It's only 100 years, mm. you see. But since anybody flew, since anybody could fly, it's only 100 years. So think of the distance we've come. So that sets the scene, where we're going now. We've got all that to cover in 20, 25 minutes, you know. And that's the kind of way I did it. So we'd go off with a first first idea, you know. And that was kids making aeroplanes. Mm-hmm. And then um, sycamore seats. Yeah. You know, propellers. So you know, what sort right? of tone were you trying to go for with Think of a Number? It, it, it was basically the idea, by thinking of a number, it could lead you anywhere. That's it.
So that was Johnny Ball telling us a bit about his journey into being a maths entertainer, effectively. There's so much enthusiasm. You can sort of hear it coming out through the uh, Still, our speakers. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's kind of amazing to think of what he's sort of seen over the years and also how things have changed. Like, you know, it's mad to think that he started with two O-levels, left school with only two O-levels, but was able to, on some level, enthuse a generation. And it's crazy to think there's nothing really like that now. I know, you, there's a gap in the market. Maths <laughs> <laughs> um, But But one interesting comment he made about keeping it simple, avoiding jargon, and mm. this just makes me think as a teacher, maths is a language, and we've got such sort of tension between mm. keeping it simple, but at the same time, equipping the kids with the jargon so they can tackle the difficult questions. So there's like a, a balancing act between the two. Yeah, it's so true. I mean, so I totally understand what he's saying regarding making it accessible, but that language is also needed, you know, to be able to access the the more complex elements and, you know, the, the words are there kind of for a reason, but it's finding that balance. And also it was interesting, his chat about like just show the numbers you know like he really did not like frogs oh, and lily pads yeah, poor, poor little frogs <laughs> yeah, they'd be out of business with him <laughs> um, yeah he wasn't wasn't keen Bobby no. um, but it's that thing of how he because he can obviously tell that he's very very good you know with mental maths things and numbers are quite kind of they come to him easily but it's where do you find the balance of people maybe who do not find it as easy to be able to work out things as quickly as maybe he's used to and but you know I, I completely agree I think every classroom should have a number line and it should be a number line that goes from negative numbers to positive numbers but also zooms in and we look at fractions and decimals and how our number system works so you know those visual elements can be really 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 powerful and helpful, I think, the, the target of a maths lesson is to get more people able to access it. So I kind of, I understand what he's saying, but it's trying to work out how that would play in an actual classroom. So we'll hear the second part of um, of our interview with Johnny Ball on next week's podcast. But right now, a maths appeal, let's go back to Bobby's puzzle. Can you remind us of the question and... Let's go through the answers. So the puzzle was you're taking part in a card game in your local village fate and you've got two sets of identical cards, so A and B. And each set has eight cards. Uh, seven of them have the digits 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. And one has a decimal point. And you have to use all the cards and create two numbers, one from pack A and one from pack B. And you're trying to create the largest difference between these two sets of cards. Right, so just as a disclaimer, puzzles aren't my thing. <laughs> <laughs> right, it's good to be good at the start, good at the start. Just putting it out there. I mean, but it's funny because for me, it's the whole emotional element of when a puzzle is read. Like, I am a maths teacher. I'm obviously on some level pretty competent and, uh, in, and confident in maths. But generally, when I hear a puzzle... I sometimes start looking into the distance. So this is actually quite good for me to like, right, okay, let's get involved, let's get in the zone. And so um, the emotions when I heard this one were actually weren't too bad. I quite like a game. I like a card game, Bobby. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, and it kind of made me think about, right, bigger, smaller difference. So what are kind of the key words there? And how do you make the biggest number? And uh, for me, thinking about that was the biggest digit, seven, and put that in the biggest place value you can possibly have, right? Did you do the same thing? Yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. And then, but then what threw, what threw me, what got me thinking a bit more was the whole idea, where does the decimal point go? So that's kind of where I think people might have got a little bit on the kind of confused side. Yeah, and what we'll tell people is that they can't just put the decimal point at the end. It's got to like read like a proper number. Oh, I did the decimal point at the end for the biggest one. Oh, actually, to be honest, I think that's a really good question because yes. in my head I'd assume that you couldn't, but that... I, that's perfectly valid as well. So actually, your answer is better than my one. Oh, so mine's bigger than yours. Okay, <laughs> yeah. right. So for people who aren't sure what's going on, for me, the way I set up my biggest number, I sort of did it, uh, so from the left going backwards, is that right? Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Good. Which as a number, uh, with a decimal point at the very end of the oh, one, okay, okay, okay. that's how I've done it. So my number is 7,654,321. Perfect. Okay, and then what do you get as your smallest number? Ah, so again, this is a good point. So did you put point one two three four five six oh. seven, or did you do one point two? I did one point two because there's no zero, and so yes. I think I just said you needed the placeholder of a zero to be able to do the decimal number. I like that. We'll stick with that. Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I did one. Yeah, one point two three four five six seven, um, which is one point 
two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then we subtract the two from yes. each other. And what did you, yeah. So, but did you, but you use a decimal point before your one. So I'm going to have to recalculate my answer. <laughs> um, so I, should I just say what I got? Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I got 7,654,319 point seven six five four three three which is tidy <laughs> and quite long and the key thing was for the biggest number i put the biggest digit in the biggest place value and then for the smallest number i put the smallest number in the biggest place of the of the place value but started at units or ones and then moved backwards from there and, and the thing i liked about this question is that it made me challenge my assumptions because I'd assumed, oh, I've got to put the decimal between the unit and the tenth. But you're like, oh, being smarter than the question writer <laughs> itself and going putting the decimal after, which is valid as well. But also, I, for me, the reason I, that I thought about it is because actually the number 13 is actually 13 and the decimal point is after the three, you just don't see it. And, you know, there's infinite number of zeros um, after the one. And there's infinite number of zeros after the decimal point. So there's placeholders everywhere. We just don't write them down. And for whole numbers, that decimal point is there. We just don't write it. And that's, I think, can really confuse some people because they think, oh, it doesn't really count, but it definitely does. And to make things a bit more confusing, I think in Europe, instead of decimal point, they write commas. Which is really confusing yes. because that's what we sometimes use to separate our thousands. Yes. yes. Math isn't always that straightforward. <laughs> it's amazing, but not always that straightforward. So get in touch and let us know how you got on with the puzzle. And over the course of the coming weeks, we'll find that Susan and I will probably have you know different methods for different questions. And that's one thing that we'd encourage you to do, because in maths, there isn't just one way of approaching a question. There's different ways of attacking the problem. So that's it from us. Thanks again for downloading episode one of Maths Appeal. If we've managed to make Maths feel even just a tiny bit more accessible and fun for you, let us know. We'd love to hear from you. So on Twitter and Instagram, we're at Maths Appeal. And if you'd like to subscribe to the podcast or leave a five-star review, we'd be over the moon. Next week, we'll be discussing types of numbers. From even and odd numbers to square numbers and prime numbers and much more, we'll explore how these numbers are grouped and why they're important and useful. And just before we go, how about a math fact from you, Bobby? So this is something that I've slightly adapted from my book, The Life-Changing Magic of Numbers, but I look at numbers and base systems. So, you know, we count in tens because we have, you know, finger, te- you know, so ten little fingers standing in front of us. But in The Simpsons, they actually have eight fingers, one thumb, three digits on each hand. But their number system is based on tens, but really they should be counting in eights. Oh, wow. That's, that's, not, that's, that's bonkers. Yeah, it's not a fact, more like a point of information. Right, so they will have real issues kind of counting in general. They anything, do. Be, anything beyond eight. They've got, yeah, or they count, they count in a different system. And the only thing is, I think God and Jesus actually has ten fingers. So maybe God and Jesus came up with a number system for the Simpsons and oh, the rest followed. That makes much more sense, of course. Of course, well, thanks for that, Bobby. Maths Appeal has been presented by Susan Okereke and Bobby Seagull. The music was composed by Kelly Okereke. The image designed by Calix Davis. And the producer, our wonderful producer, is Jennifer Nelson.